Hello and welcome to Stories from India, a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I'm a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. Today's episode is a story set in ancient India, long before things like Uber and Amazon, but also before essentials like doctors. And yet, somehow, they had mastered teleportation. Obviously, this is fiction. Unlike mythology, which I can often provide an eyewitness account of, today's story is a folk tale and therefore not something that actually happened. This is a folk tale from the western Indian state of Gujarat. So let's jump in. Imagine a dark forest at midnight. Some wolves howled nearby. Bats flew overhead. The forest floor was full of creepy crawlies and slithering serpents. This was no place for a princess, especially a princess with no armor, no weapons, no flashlight, and no phone. She had on rich clothes and shiny jewelry but those would not help her against the wolves and lions and tigers and bears if anything her shiny jewelry and clothes were somehow attracting bugs and probably larger creatures princess chicky had no choice she stumbled on going in a direction that she thought would get her to safety only she was headed the wrong way and kept going deeper and deeper into the forest how had she ended up in this state just a few hours ago her world had been completely different she had been at the king's palace She was the king's favorite daughter. Her six sisters may not have been exactly happy with that. But that did not stop them from being super nice to her. At least on the surface. But it all started to go south at the dinner table. A frequent battleground that has split many a family apart. That's what happened in this case as well. The king had this habit of talking about philosophy during dinner time. Yesterday's discussion had been about what reality meant. Were they all real people or just characters in a story that would be retold as a podcast episode centuries from now? or were they all a simulation in the matrix today's question was one which would have had a boolean answer tell me my children he said what is the reason for your prosperity is it because of your own luck or is it because of mine when the king to whom you owe everything that you have in life asks you such a question it might be unwise to credit your own luck and not his six daughters were with the program chiki was not she said obviously it's my own fate my own luck sure You have your kingdom, your riches, this palace. But if I wasn't also lucky, I would not be born your daughter. 
So it's my luck that's responsible for my prosperity and my happiness. That absolutely infuriated the king. Even though he should have seen it coming, asking a question like that. Obviously, you did not hear me clearly, he said to Chiki. Must have been all the disturbing sounds of my golden cutlery being used to eat my food off of my table and in my palace. So let me ask again, am I? I mean, is my luck responsible for your happiness or is it yours? But Chiki would not change her position. One of the sisters tried to diffuse the situation. What is luck after all? she asked. Isn't it all just a big collective stack of chance and community chest cards that all humans are drawing from? But that analogy did not actually help. Even though the king was a huge Monopoly fan, the king signaled for silence and summoned one of his soldiers. Take Cheeky here to room 101, he said. Room 101 was quite like in the George Orwell novel, 1984, but it was not an actual room. It was a code name for the dark forest where we saw Chiki stumbling at the start of the story. So that's how she had ended up in the forest. Now, there were at least a few more hours of night before dawn. Assuming she could even tell the difference between day and night in this dark forest with its super thick canopy. Somehow, she managed to find a cave. She proceeded to check it out carefully, hoping there were no tigers here. She definitely wanted to avoid meeting one. Skilled outdoorswoman that she was, she wasn't sure that she could avoid hurting one if she ran into it and her Project Tiger sponsors might not take kindly to that. With the winds, she realized they would probably drop her as their ambassador. Like everything else, that project was funded by her father. But there were no tigers in the cave, or lions, or bears. That cave became her temporary home while she built a hut for herself. She had contemplated returning to civilization, but decided that it wasn't worth it. It seemed a lot more peaceful out here. Meanwhile, back at the palace, the king had a question for his remaining daughters. This one was not a philosophical one. I'm off on a work trip tomorrow, he said. I'm sailing to the neighboring kingdom of Mar-a-Lago. What would you like me to get you? Now that they had seen what could happen to them if they provided a non-cookie-cutter response, his six daughters had firmly stereotypical answers ready for all such situations. So they asked for diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and gold, and so on. But as the king was attempting to cast off, his ship would not leave the dock. Every engineer and sailor swore they could not explain it. The wind was full, the tide was high. Other boats were casting off, no problem. And yes, they had definitely raised the anchor. Maybe 
put the anchor back in the water and raise it again and see if that helps? Asked one minister. Foreshadowing a long tradition of rebooting that our civilization now takes for granted. Have you tried kicking the tires? Asked another minister. Landlubber, mumbled a third. Maybe all it needs is a jump start. But it wasn't any of those things. When physics fails to provide an explanation, people are quick to turn to metaphysics. The royal astrologers were brought in. They had a ready answer. Your Majesty, it's because you haven't asked all your daughters what to bring back for them. Only then did the king remember. Oh yes, that girl, what was her name? Kichi? Chini? Oh, got it, Chiki. She's probably passed on from this world. Eaten by wild animals, I suppose. No, your majesty, said one astrologer. She's alive. This ship-holding spell only applies to living people. She's certainly around somewhere. The king was annoyed that Chiki was delaying his important voyage. But he sent a soldier to locate her in the vicinity of room 101 and to ask her what she wanted. But to hurry. The soldier did hurry. He was smart though. So rather than attempting to find her in the vast forest, he went straight to the post office. The postman was glad to draw him a map. The postman also asked the soldier to please ask her to locate somewhere more sensible. He had to make the terrible journey at least once a week just to deliver Chiki her magazines and letters. The soldier dashed off, didn't even bother to acknowledge the postman's request. When he got to Chiki's house, he was surprised that it wasn't as terrible a place as he had imagined. Princess Chiki, the king is asking what you'd like him to get for you from Maralago. Unfortunately, at that very moment, Chiki was in the shower. All she heard was some mumbling. She shouted, Sabar, which is a word that means wait. Basically, she was telling the soldier to be patient. But the soldier, thinking that's what she wanted, rushed back. Sure. He had never heard of an object called Sabar. He didn't understand half the time what these royals spoke. But it was probably a new designer line of handbags. Or maybe a new make of some car or something. He rushed back to the king and gave him the message. Chiki wanted Sabar. The king had no idea either but he didn't really care anymore. Because the boat had begun moving, finally. During the journey, the king was wondering, but not about what Sabar meant, but that his astrologers had finally made a prediction that had actually come to pass. He decided that he would give them the extra funding they had been asking for. He completely forgot about Sabar and immersed himself in having a great time at Mara Lago. It involved plenty of golfing, of course. He did not forget to get his six daughters all of their gifts. And so it was that when he attempted to sail back, the ship again would not move. 
This time, he did not need an astrologer to tell him why it was stuck. He commissioned his soldiers to go fetch Sabar, whatever that was. While the king was complaining about having to continue to pay expensive docking fees at this harbour, his soldiers went far and wide, searching for Sabar. One of them finally found an old lady who claimed that she had a stone in her garden. It had been in her family for generations. They had always called it the Sabar Stone. The soldier quickly picked up the stone, gave her a gold coin and began making off with the stone. Her eyes went wide at the gold coin. She hastily added, Wait, wait, I also have a bridge to sell you. It's called the Sabar Bridge. But that did not work. A single Sabar was all that the king had promised. That's all Chiki would be getting. When the soldier returned with the stone, the ship's charm deactivated the holding mechanism and they were able to sail away, back to their kingdom. Technically, now that they were sailing, the king could have just tossed the stone overboard. But there was a bit of a risk. What if the ship stalled in the middle of the ocean? So he decided, no, it was best to see this through. So the Sabar stone was delivered to Chiki. And by the same soldier who had been here before. The king did not want to rely on his own postal service for such an important task that had the potential to cripple pretty much anything, if not carried out. When the soldier got to Chiki's home, she was outside. He threw the stone at her and laughed and said, Here's your supper. Maybe you can use it to wash your clothes. And he rode off back to town. Chiki was stunned and annoyed. A few weeks ago, someone had pranked her by knocking on the door right when she was in the shower and they disappeared by the time she hurried out to open the door. And now, this guy had thrown a stone at her. But this was no ordinary neighborhood kid pulling a prank. He was a soldier in her father's army. She guessed that this was probably a gift from her father. She didn't understand why he had sent her a stone. But there must be something special about it. She did wash her clothes on this stone, just as the soldier had suggested. But this was a strange stone. Clearly, it had weathered a lot of the elements, having lived in the old lady's garden for generations. Yet, when Chiki washed her clothes on it, it rapidly withered away. Maybe it was the brand of soap she was using. She scrubbed the stone a little bit with it. And pretty soon, it crumbled. And this was extremely weird. There was a fan inside it. Not an electrical fan, but the kind of little folding hand-operated fan that's often seen during the summer in stadiums, especially in tropical countries. Naturally, she was thankful for this gift. If you have experienced an Indian summer, you can surely see this was a very practical gift. She opened it and gave it a wave. 
and the moment she did that there was a flash and a puff of smoke genie she said yay i dreamt of this my whole life i know exactly what to wish for to get around all the provisos and limitations but the person who appeared out of all the smoke was no genie he was a prince i am no genie i am a prince prince sabar he said i am the man of the fan chiki had done some research on the internet and found the twitter feed of the old woman in maralago who claimed to have made a huge profit out of the apparently useless sabar stone that had been in her family for generations but the fan has been inside the stone for generations how old are you she asked him i don't really know how that works said the prince i think it's the name i learned from those who summoned me that the previous sabar was just some random dude in australia it's a luck thing so how does this work she asked have i won a prize what am i getting out of this i told you i'm no genie he said i don't do the wish thing but i definitely have to obey your summons every time you wave that fan upwards i have to appear when you wave it downwards i'll go back that's it it's a cool party trick but nothing more she was disappointed but the two got to talking and occasionally sabar would come over for tea and cookies over time they confided in each other eventually they became friends and then more with time chiki's lifestyle began to improve sabar had had a palace constructed for her right there bit by bit sabar would bring over construction material provisions people and architects with him every time he visited which was often sabar continued to lead a double life staying in the role of prince back in his home country and here as chiki's fiance i don't know why he didn't just take her back with him to his palace or why he didn't introduce her to his family and all if he had a lot of the things that were to follow could have been easily avoided well back in chiki's father's palace lots of rumors were floating around about the lavish palace that chiki lived in her sisters had to see it for themselves so they sneaked off into the forest with proper equipment of course and with a guide they arrived when sabar wasn't around but chiki received them enthusiastically sabar was a great companion but he was gone most of the time and here were her sisters whom she had grown up with she told them the truth about everything it may prove her point about her own luck being responsible for her current happiness but that was not going to go well with their father as one sister pointed out he would say that he was the one who had gotten her the sabar stone in the first place but they left it at that chiki was thrilled to have met her sisters after such a long time in her excitement she completely failed to notice that they had poisoned sabar's coffee cup 
When Summer returned, the sisters were already gone. After hearing that the sisters had visited Chiki, he became uneasy. This wasn't just an ordinary tension people sometimes have with their in-laws. He was not happy about how her sisters had not lifted a finger to stop Chiki's expulsion from the palace or how they had not worked harder to change their father's mind. He didn't say much though. He just started drinking his coffee. A few sips in, the effect of the poison hit him. And he screamed at Chiki. Help me! No, wait, don't help me! Stay away from me! I'm never returning to you. This is all your sister's doing. They poisoned my coffee. Wave your fan, quickly. Send me back, just do it now. Chiki acted quickly. She did wave the fan and Sabar disappeared. That had been the right thing to do. Here, in the dark forest, an ambulance and doctors were miles away, but probably not so in Sabar's palace. She should have gone with him though. And now she dared not summon him back. The doctors in Sabar's palace might find it hard to treat him if he kept disappearing off of the operating table. She waited a week, anxiously. With trepidation, she waved her fan. But no one appeared. Her mood darkened further as she examined the possibilities. Could it be that Sabar had passed away? Why then did the next Sabar in line not appear? Maybe her prince was still alive, but had found a way to anchor himself back in his kingdom. Yeah, that must be it. She must find him. But wait a minute. She realized with a shock that she did not even know the name of his kingdom or anything about him. Come to think of it, there were a lot of red flags here. She hadn't seen a single photo of his other life. He hadn't referred to anyone else in the kingdom by name. He had not mentioned the name of the kingdom, or its capital, or its neighbors. He had also not dropped any hints about flora or fauna in his home kingdom. Was he even a prince? Was he just an unemployed guy living out of his parents' basement? But no. He had brought back enough stuff to construct the palace and there certainly could not have been other summoning fans, or she would have observed him disappearing. So he had been faithful then. Maybe. Well, she would find out. And if he was true to her, she would find a way to help him. Chiki set out. She charted a course to all the known kingdoms. She would travel outwards through the neighboring kingdoms in a spiral and ask around for a prince, Sabar, assuming that was his name. Or maybe she would just ask for a guy who had been poisoned. A doctor's disguise might help, which basically meant pretending to be a man. In those days, a female doctor was unheard of and more importantly, would not be believed by anyone. And so she began her long journey. For many months, she had no luck. 
no one had ever heard of a sick prince or a prince sabar one day tired and resting under a tree chiki was startled by some noises she calmed herself when she realized it was just a couple of birds talking wait what birds talking and she could understand them well there's a lot of unexplained stuff in this story like the ship that would not sail and the back story of the stone so what's one more mystery she asked herself one of the birds said to the other have you heard about prince sabar poor guy is lying in a bed rapidly weakening from the poison haven't the doctors helped asked the other exposition bird nope they don't have the right medicine there's only one kind of medicine that can possibly help him and that is my hum <clears throat> droppings you disgusting said the other bird it's true take my word for it i wish i was a human doctor looking fellow just like that guy sleeping down there i could then just collect some of my droppings which i left on the third branch of this tree i could make them into a paste and then apply it to the prince's body that will instantly heal him but how will a doctor get to sabar's palace asked the other bird it's actually not that far now from here it's 30 miles west as people walk assuming they walk in a straight line which i'm pretty sure they don't anyway there's one raging river that the doctor has to cross there are no bridges but all a hypothetical doctor needs is the bark of this very tree this bark is magic he just has to make shoes out of them then he can walk across the river a hypothetical doctor should be able to make shoes it's not hard even someone like the guy sleeping down there and the birds flew off being handed the solution on a silver platter that way chiki quickly made her shoes and headed in the direction of sabar's palace and she was sure to collect the birds droppings into an ointment jar when chiki finally got to sabar's kingdom it seemed overrun with people needing help apparently all of the kingdom's doctors were focused on sabar alone without success they spotted chiki and rushed to her doctor doctor i need your help many people addressed her but chiki said that she was a doctor who specialized only in treating poison princes the crowd let out a collective disappointed groan someone mumbled about the hippocratic oath but it was easy to weasel out of that one given the oath had not been invented yet chiki got to the palace and volunteered her services her joy at being able to see sabar's face quickly turned into worry at how weak he had become she figured she was here in the nick of time though who knew maybe a real doctor did she did note that he had tied himself to the bed post to anchor himself in his own kingdom that's why he had not appeared when she had waved the fan Chiki was careful not to reveal her identity or her gender. She began applying the ointment. Everyone around
complained about its awful smell. But that did not stop them from hugging the prince when he jumped up, full of energy and fully healed. Sabar's parents and Sabar himself were ecstatic. They wanted to reward this doctor, even unto half their kingdom. But strangely, all the doctor asked for was the prince's personal ring and his personal hat and scarf. An odd choice, but no one complained. This was a bargain. Chiki was ecstatic, but she decided not to reveal herself just yet. This should be done on home turf, she thought. She rushed back home. She changed into her finest clothes and summoned Sabar with her fan. He did appear, but he was not smiling. Why did you call me here? So your sisters can poison me again? He asked, rudely. Nope, I'll have nothing more to do with them. I've called you here because I want to know how you're doing. I've survived, replied the prince. No thanks to you. Lucky for me, a doctor happened to have the cure. Well... I hope you paid that doctor well then, said Chiki. No, replied Sabar. All the doctor wanted was my ring, my hat and my scarf. This ring? This hat? This scarf? She asked, pulling the items from behind her back. Sabar was obviously shocked. He heard the whole story from her. The two reconciled and decided to move to Sabar's kingdom. Their wedding was a huge deal and everyone was invited, including Chiki's father. She had clearly told Sabar she would have nothing more to do with her sisters. Maybe that's why they weren't invited. When her father arrived, somehow, despite everything, Chiki actually reconciled with her father. That's where the story ends. I have a serious problem with the ending, which I'll get to in a second. A few notes on the show. The original folktale is titled Prince Sabar and does not even name the princess. That, in my opinion, is a terrible omission, given the story is of Chiki and not of Sabar. But hey, what do you expect from a patriarchal society? So I gave her the name Chiki. Kind of a cheeky way to abbreviate her pretend profession. That of a doctor. Or Chikitsak as it is called in Hindi. The original story also had the very inexplicable scene of Chiki begging her father for forgiveness at the conclusion of the story. A moment that I don't understand at all. To be honest, when I first learned the story, I was expecting exactly the opposite to happen. So, I intentionally left that part vague in today's episode. Also, Chiki and her father may have reconciled, but they did not actually reconcile on whose luck was responsible for her happiness. There are some elements of this story that we have kind of seen before. The six jealous co-queens tricking a queen into annoying the king in episode 57, Astro Boy. In today's episode, they did more than annoy, but it did end up with the king and queen separating. Another analogy for the talking birds 
आर द टॉकिंग स्नैक्स फ्रॉम एपिसोड फोर्टी फोर एंड फोर्टी फाइव हरी पॉट ब्रेकर एट द एंड ऑफ द स्टोरी द फेट ऑफ द ईवल सिस्टर्स इज अनकलियर या इफ यू आर द डॉटर ऑफ द किंग I suppose you can get away with pretty much anything poisoning your brother-in-law registering patents in foreign countries in exchange for policy decisions marketing on behalf of your father's private enterprises when holding public office and so on in the original story they did more than just poison sabar but i've skipped those parts to keep the story mild and to avoid giving you a nightmare that's all for now in the next episode we are back to the mahabharat we'll see what happened after bhishma's promise and how emperor shantanu's bloodline was in one problem after another if you have comments or suggestions or if there are particular stories you would like to hear Please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at @sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. Thanks to all of you listeners for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. I'll see you next time.